Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship at the St. John United Church of Christ in Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Dale Raines. I'm pastor here at St. John, and it's my joy to welcome you to a time of worship. We are still, of course, worshiping online only, and we're doing, I'm doing this live on Sunday morning, uh, the 14th of March at 1030 a.m., my suspicion is that this week there may be fewer of you that are watching live and more of you that may be watching at a later time since uh, last night was when we sprang our clocks forward. So uh, we lost an hour of beauty sleep last night. And goodness knows I need all of that I can get. But, uh, but I'm here and I'm glad that you're worshiping with us whenever that is convenient for you to do. As always, I encourage you, uh, whenever you're worshiping with us, to take time here now, and if you haven't already done so, gather elements that you'll need to share with us in a time of Holy Communion later on during our worship time. I hope that you will participate in worship with us by doing that and by, by sharing in the prayer time with us that, uh, that I'll lead a little later on in our worship as well. Whatever the week has meant for you, I'm, I'm glad that you're setting aside some time to, to recenter and reground yourself. We are on this Lenten journey together, and we need uh, this time of worship to be reminded of what it means to walk in the way of the, cro of the cross. Let's worship together. Listen and let these words draw us into a spirit of worship. In our privilege, we have believed that we are the ones who have all the answers to life's problems. But when those who have little to offer all they have, we are put to shame. In our power, we believe that might is right. But when those who are powerless offer love and mercy, we are put to shame. Joy fills our lives when we center our lives on Jesus Christ. Hope fills our hearts when we focus on following our Savior. Comfort fills our spirits when we commit to living in the way of Jesus. Peace fills our souls when we seek to do God's work of love. Come, let us celebrate and praise our Lord. Let's pray together. Gracious God, your steadfast love is everlasting. You have come among us in Christ Jesus. Where there is darkness, you bring light. Where there is sadness, you speak words of hope. Where there is despair, you bring new possibilities. You bring healing for the sick and forgiveness for the sinner. You bring justice for the oppressed, speaking truth instead of lies. Stir us with your spirit, O oh God, in this time of worship. Awaken our joy and our reverence as we offer you our songs and our silence, our prayers and our praises, for you are our God. Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. 
And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the Gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy One, it is so easy for us to be distracted from, from you, from your Spirit. God, the, the words that I am about to speak may mean something to a few people, but even more, we all need to, to sense that word from you, whatever you would speak into our, into our minds, into our hearts, into our lives. And so help us to set aside those distractions to open our minds and hearts and to make space for you to speak. Help us to listen, not even so much with our ears, but with our very hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I am still a fan of the TV show MASH. I remember as a pretty young person watching when it was first, those first few years it was on TV. I remember in college watching the finale of the series, which by the way is still the most watched episode of a TV show ever. And I still like watching the reruns when I happen to, to catch them on TV, even though I've seen all of them countless times. One fun episode of the show involves one of the doctors, B.J. Honeycutt, receiving a murder mystery novel in the mail. Well, this is a, a big deal in a MASH unit when that one was set to be uh, in, in existence back in the early 1950s. They didn't have many sources of outside entertainment. And so the novel gets passed around the unit, around the characters in the show. But they're all left in suspense as to who killed Lord Cheevers because the last page of the novel was missing. All of the novel up to that point, everything was important, but they were left hanging without that last page. Finishing the story or the idea or the sentence is important. And it's not just about having an obsessive need for closure. Some of you finished that knocking rhythm, didn't you? But that's not what I'm talking about. For instance, imagine what is purported to be a, a comprehensive biography of Abraham Lincoln. A and it goes into great detail as to his family background, and talking about his birth here in Kentucky and, and about his, his early years, his childhood and his early career his campaigns for elected office, including a, a defeat along the way. But then the biography ends with his election to the presidency in 1860, as though that was the, the, the climax and, and there really was nothing more to say. Well, see, we know that there was more to say. Perhaps the... the the majority of Lincoln's life had already 
occurred and a lot of important things had happened to bring him to that point. But there was a lot to say about the life and work of Abraham Lincoln after 1860. You see, the first part isn't the only part. The first part doesn't necessarily give the whole picture or the whole story or even the full intent. Well, when reading or hearing today's scripture lesson, it's, it's really difficult not to zero in on that one verse. You know the verse I'm talking about. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. How can we not zero in on that? It's, it's the most memorized verse in the Bible. Plastered on everything from billboards to signs to tattoos to the eye black strip that Tim, Tim Tebow wore when he was playing football at the University of Florida. And it admittedly does seem to be a self-contained statement. There is a period at the end of that sentence, after all. But too many of us do with that verse what is done with far too many other verses or passages of Scripture by far too many people. We lift it out of context, ignoring the setting, who was speaking, to whom they were speaking, and the circumstances and all of that, but also separating it from what else was said in that same setting and instance. Too often leaving off the last page, so to speak. And we miss something pretty important if we do that with this verse. Now, there are a lot of interesting details. The the setting, that it was at nighttime, and that this was Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. Who, Pharisees and Jesus, normally we think of them in, in adversarial terms. But of particular importance... For us today is what follows that verse, the one that is so well known. The very next thing that Jesus said was the next verse, which is, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Ah, Jesus mission, why Jesus was sent into the world, did not involve condemnation. He wasn't on his way to a cross because he came to condemn. In fact, kind of the opposite. He got in trouble for not condemning, for hanging out with people that the really religious people did condemn. So in essence, he was condemned for not condemning. You see, rather than condemn, he came to embrace. The only ones that he spoke any words of condemnation for were those who were exclusionary, who drew lines and built walls to shut people out of God's kingdom, the outcast and the sinner, to the marginalized and the misfit, to all of, all of those people, Jesus spoke words of love and grace. Of course, that was a big part of what put him on a path to a cross. But it seems as though many in, in the church, church with a big C worldwide, many in the church seem to have missed that. 
many branches of the worldwide church seem preoccupied with condemnation, condemning people for their sexual orientation or for not following a prescribed moral code or for not voting according to the party line and condemning other churches for not condemning those people and definitely condemning churches for affirming them. And we at St. John have been on the receiving end of some of that condemnation. I have heard people refer to us as a church of Satan simply because we followed the example of Jesus. And the overall result of that, not just for St. John, but across the board, the overall result in individuals is lots of pain. And lots of people choosing to reject those churches and sadly, in many instances, choosing to reject the Christian faith because of the example of it that they have seen and experienced. But listen to it again. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The way of Jesus is not the way of condemnation. To take up a cross to follow Jesus requires laying down that urge to condemn. In our denominational home, the United Church of Christ, we say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. May we as a church <clears throat> and as the people of that church live up to and into that statement, choosing to welcome rather than condemn, choosing to truly love, choosing the way of the cross. Amen. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer at this time. And as always, I encourage you to, to lift to God whatever is weighing upon your heart and mind today. And then a little later on, as I, as I lead us in a time of praying the prayer of our Lord, I invite you to join me in that prayer as well. Let's pray. Oh God, deliver us from the inclination, the desire even to condemn to condemn those we deem different, to condemn those we deem unworthy, con to condemn those we deem undeserving. Help us to see that when we condemn others, in reality we condemn ourselves. Forgive us and heal us, we pray. On this weekend of remembrance for Breonna Taylor, God, we pray for change. For far too long, our black siblings have lived in fear of those who are sworn to protect and to serve because they have seen abundant evidence that all too often they are not included in those who are protected and those who are served. 
they have experienced all too often that equal justice under the law has not included them. And so we pray not only just for justice for Brianna, but justice for all, no matter their skin tone, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their language or religion or gender or gender identity or sexual orientation or any other thing that has up to now impacted the fundamental rights that people have been afforded in this country. Surely it is time, O oh Lord. We pray for change. Holy One, we pray for an end to this now year-long pandemic. It's been a year of sickness, of death, and of untold other losses. It's been a year since we've gathered together in this space. We are thankful for so many signs of hope for plans for children returning to school, for the hope of returning to in-person worship. We are thankful for so many who are stepping up to receive a vaccine, hastening the pandemic's end. And we pray that those who are skeptical would come to see the benefits, not, not only for themselves, but also for their neighbors, for all of us. God, we play, pray for an end to the plagues, not only the plague of COVID-19, but the plagues of misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories, and fear. Oh God, today we find ourselves in the middle of our journey through this time of Lent. As in any long journey, it can be come easy to be weary, perhaps discouraged. And so as we seek to walk in the way of the cross, help us to keep our focus on Jesus, on his selflessness, on his willingness to sacrifice for the good of us all. Most of all, on the incredible love with which he lived and died. Teach us day by day to walk in that way, the way of the cross. And hear us now as we pray together, O oh God, our Mother, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now in our worship we come to a time of coming to the table. I so long for that day when I can look out in this space and see your faces and invite you physically to this table. But until then, know that wherever you are, whatever the circumstances that you are invited to Christ's table and whatever you have before you is the table of Christ in these moments. I hope you have gathered those elements so that you can share in this time. Friends, the Lord is with you. So lift up your hearts and give thanks to the Holy One. You created us, O God, to live in communion with you, yet we turned away. 
we come during this Lenten season, knowing our failings, but trusting your steadfast love. We come reflecting on the mystery of the cross. We dare to ponder resurrection. We remember that on his final evening with his disciples, Jesus took bread and when he had broke it, he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus did the same with the cup saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts on our behalf, we bring our whole selves to you as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. And Christ will come again. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup. May this meal be for us signs of your great mercy, forgiveness of our sins, and promise of salvation. And now, take and eat in remembrance of Jesus. And take and drink from the cup, remembering our Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have nourished us in this meal <clears throat> and fed our bodies and our souls. We have heard your love, so send us out to speak it. We have seen your love, so send us out to show it. We have been fed on your love, so send us out to share it. And let all things be done for your glory. Amen. It is, as always, good to spend time in worship with you. Let me share just a few things before we close this time of worship. One is a, a thanks to all who continue to financially support the ministry of St. John. I do want to share with you information about an additional offering that we are receiving during this month of March. We are one of several denominations that participate in by receiving an offering called One Great Hour of Sharing. And uh, I, I love this offering partly because of its ecumenical nature, so many denominations that participate in it but also because of what the money received does. It goes to, um, to offer developmental aid in, in areas of the world where that is needed, but also disaster relief aid. And uh, that is something that we see a need for in so many places, but it goes not only to various places around the world, but even places close to home. It may very well be that people who have suffered through some of the, the events in, in recent weeks uh, from weather-related disasters may very well receive help through the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. So if you would like to contribute to that, uh, if you send a check to the church, in the memo line of that check, uh, write One Great Hour of Sharing, or you can just simply put OGHS, and also, if you give it by way of Venmo, make sure and, and uh, note that as well. So we encourage you to prayerfully uh, give to that offering in addition to your regular offerings to the church. Uh, we are continuing our Lenten book group this coming Wednesday night. If you've not been able to join us, but you've thought about it, uh, and are thinking that, well, now it would be too late. Um, it's, it's not too late. You can still join in. Uh, we'll be uh, 
meeting this this Wednesday evening at 7 by way of Zoom and talking about chapter 3 of James, James Cone's book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. If you'd like to join in that and haven't previously, just email our church office and let us know and we'll send you the link to be able to join in on that meeting on Wednesday evening. Now, a, a word that I have been longing to give um, and finally can do so, and that is that tentatively, barring any, uh, anything happening between now and then, we are planning to resume in-person worship on Easter Sunday, April the 4th. Now, that worship will look uh, a bit different from worship in the past that we've had here. We're still going to be observing CDC protocols, which will mean wearing masks, observing social distancing, and, uh, and unfortunately still no congregational singing. But we'll be able to be in this space uh, together, those who feel safe in doing so. And we'll be sending out some information in our church newsletter uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks and also on our church Facebook page uh, if you would like to uh, learn more about what that's going to look like and, and what it will mean to come and be part of that. But uh, it has been literally uh, over a year now. Last Sunday was the 52nd Sunday that we had not been in this space together, which means this is the 53rd, so we're, we're past a year now. But um, thanks to, to dedicated work on the part of, of so many of us in wearing masks and following the guidelines, but also, of course, um, because of the availability of vaccines and them beginning to be uh, more and more widely distributed, and the effects that we're seeing uh, in the country as a result of that in declining numbers, um, we are finally getting to the point where we feel like we can relatively safely come back together. So we look forward to that, and, and I look forward to seeing many of your faces in just a few short weeks. We'll have more to share about that in, in the weeks ahead. Um, but uh, keep that in mind as we, as we move toward Easter. Now, as we close this time of worship, I would say to you to know that the ever-present mystery that we call God is in your past forgiving you, is in your present loving you, and is already in your future meeting you. So go and be the church. In the name of God, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit. Amen.